Hey everybody, I am going to make a bold prediction. I am going to predict that three kind of a lot of people consider them boring real estate stocks are going to outperform Nvidia, which has been one of the highest flying stocks in the market over the next year. And by the next year, we'll define that as by the end of 2025. So at the end of 2025, I will come back and revisit this video and completely admit that I was wrong if I am. But I have a feeling that NVIDIA's next year's performance is going to be meh. Like it, a lot of the growth is already baked in at this point. And I think real estate is going to have an excellent year, especially if interest rates come down as they are expected to do. So before we dive in, please take a minute and check out the, the link you see on your screen, fool.com slash Frankel. Get the top 10 stocks to buy right now from The Motley Fool. They're my sponsor. It's the best way to support this work I'm doing on YouTube. Again, fool.com slash Frankel. And please subscribe to my channel if you don't already. I cover a lot of real estate stocks, a lot of financial stocks. Love to have you join me on this investing journey. Again, um, so uh, check out the, the subscription button you see on your screen as well. So let's dive right in. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So the first one is a company called EPR Properties. So I'm saying that these three companies, you know, on average, will outperform NVIDIA over the next year. And I know that's a bold prediction. So I can't wait to see what some of the comments on this are going to be. So EPR Properties, they're a, in a real estate investment trust. All three of these are, but they are an experiential focused real estate. They focus on businesses that can be considered kind of retail, but that sell experiences, not actual products. The biggest example is the, the one that's really drugged the stock down over the past couple of years, if we're being honest, that is movie theaters. Uh, they own about 40% of their rent comes from movie theaters. And their two biggest uh, movie theater tenants are AMC Entertainment and Regal Entertainment. Regal, of course, just went through a bankruptcy that actually got resolved in EPR's favor. Uh, but AMC's future is, and just the future of the overall, you know, box office landscape is very much in flux right now. Um, so that's a potential negative on the stock. They generally own the best performing theaters in, in their uh, respective markets. Not like these, you know, older beat up theaters you see on the on the side of the road. These are big megaplexes that are in like downtown shopping districts and things like that. Um, but a risk factor nonetheless. So the other sixty percent of the rent comes from properties like so called eat and play uh, attractions. Top Golf is the number two overall tenant in the portfolio. That's one in that category. Uh, there's a lot of water parks. There are ski resorts. Vail Resorts is a major tenant of EPRs. Uh, EPR owns the real estate on some of Vail's uh, ski resorts. There's, you know, cultural attractions like museums. There's a gaming property in the portfolio. It's a very high quality portfolio. You know, ma you can make the argument other than the movie theaters, um, which are decent quality, I would call them. Uh, but great risk reward here. This is a monthly dividend payer. It pays a 7.2% dividend yield. It's earning its profits more than cover that. It sees a hundred billion dollar plus addressable market opportunity here. The balance sheet is fantastic. Um, debt is very reasonable. Um, they have a, a, you know over a billion dollars in total liquidity right now. So I like EPR. That's one of my fa my top picks for an undervalued stock. And I think as rates come down, which I'll discuss the effects on of interest rates on REITs in a little bit. But as rates come down, I think this one has a lot of room to grow. Um, so that's number one. Number two, a lot of people have probably heard me talk about Vici Properties before. Ticker symbol is V-I-C-I. They are the world's largest owner of gaming real estate. They're the largest landowner on the Las Vegas Strip. They own the real estate um, of Caesars Palace. They own MGM Grand, uh, Mandalay Bay. There's a bunch of, a few other ones. The Venetian uh, is one of theirs that they recently acquired that one. They own a lot of regional gaming assets. If you live near the Atlantic City area, they own the Borgata. Um, if you live near the D.C. area, they own the MGM National Harbor, uh, the real estate, not the business itself. Um, but it was formed as a spin out of Caesars Entertainment. It ended up acquiring its MGM spun off counterpart, MGM Growth Properties, and then it acquired the Venetian recently. Um, but it's not just planning to be a gaming real estate company forever. They re recently started branching out into other types of experiential properties. They bought a portfolio of Bolero Entertainment Centers, for example. Um, five, a little over 5% dividend yield right now. I really like this company because they have very, very high tenant quality. 
their top tenants are companies you would expect, Caesars Entertainment, MGM Resorts. Um, and th these companies sign, you know, 50-year leases on, this, on these properties. And all, almost all of their leases, like 95% of them, the rent that they receive is indexed to inflation. So if we see inflation creep up, their rent goes up, not, a, not necessarily one for one, but it's linked to inflation. Um, great record so far. They're a relatively young company as a standalone business. Great record of, of making value-adding acquisitions. MGM Growth Properties in Venetian both added, uh, earnings per, added earnings on a per share basis to, to Vici, which isn't totally common when companies go on kind of buying sprees like that. Um, company I really like, love their management team. Last but certainly not least is Realty Income, the first REIT I ever bought and one that I still own and add to regularly. Um, this company has a great track record of handily beating the S&P 500 over long periods, uh, about a 14% annualized total return since they went public in 1994, a 5% or so dividend yield paid out in monthly installments. They own freestanding properties, over 15,000 of them. Mostly about 80% are occupied by retail. Um, so these are not just your general retail businesses. These are companies that either sell things people need, sell things at a discount, and or you know, sell services that need physical locations. They're not very recession prone and they're not easily disrupted by e-commerce. The business is built for stability, predictability, and growing cash flow over time. Their tenants sign long-term, what are called triple net leases. That means their tenants are responsible for uh, taxes, building insurance, and most maintenance items. These leases have you know 10 plus year initial terms. They have annual rent increases known as escalators built right in. And the company has a great history of smart capital allocation. They're really good at you know knowing exactly how much they should borrow, how much they should issue with new shares to buy new properties at a yield that will make shareholders the most money. Um, the history reflects that. It's a company that I have had in my portfolio for well over a decade now um, and plan to hold for the long term. The big part of my eventual income strategy. So I think all three of these have the potential to beat, you know, the big tech stocks, including NVIDIA, over the next year or two. So REITs were the worst performing part of the stock market during the 2022-2023 downturn and the rate hike cycle in particular because they are highly sensitive to rising interest rates. So there's a few reasons for that. It's not just borrowing costs, although rising rates do make REITs, uh, borrowing money more expensive and REITs are very reliant on borrowed money. Kind of like when you buy a house, you probably used a mortgage. Um, REITs do the same kind of thing when they buy properties. So it's also just because, I don't want to get into an economics lesson here, but because these are dividend-focused companies. And if you can get a risk-free 5% plus yield on you know, a CD or a treasury or something like that, you have less motivation to take the risk, in quotes, of a stock like realty income that pays a 5% yield as well. If you can just, if your your focus is income and you can get that from a CD or treasury, you might shift some money that way. So it tends to create kind of selling pressure on REITs when, when interest rates rise. And the opposite is true when interest rates fall. So as rates start to normalize, there's a big opportunity for all three of these to outperform. They're three very high quality businesses, great leadership teams, all have 5% plus yields. So a 5% plus yield, and if the the interest rate uh, tailwinds can kind of lift the stock, it's pretty easy to see how they could have market beating total returns over the next couple of years. And I think that's exactly what's going to happen. Again, I will be more than happy to revisit this um, toward the end of 2025 and see if I was right or totally wrong. Um, but I think there's a greater chance than people think that stocks like these will outperform the big tech companies over at least the next year and a few months or so until the end of 2025. I want to thank The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. The Motley Fool is a company that provides investing insight and stock recommendations for investors of all skill sets and risk levels. You all know how much I love researching new stocks and trying to find the next best investment. So I'm proud to partner with The Motley Fool to bring you 10 stock picks from the popular product Stock Advisor. Stock Advisor has beaten the market by nearly five times. So go to fool.com slash Frankel to get your 10 stock picks now. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor returns are 767% as of July 5th, 2024, and are measured against the S&P 500 returns of 163% 
as of July 5th, 2024.